All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Alice, and I'm a third year student in the Master of Architecture program at Columbia University. I'm originally from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and one of the co-directors of LATIGSAP. LATIGSAP is an interdisciplinary student organization in the Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, dedicated to the promotion, discussion, and reflection of contemporary issues and ideas in Latin America. The overarching theme selected by Latin GSEP for the semester is authority. Authority refers to the acknowledgement of the existence of oneself through the capacity to recognize the other as such, a singular subjective person. Authority is an essential process to achieve empathy, the capacity to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. If we cannot see the other, we cannot respect them, or if we can only see the other as the negation of oneself, we cannot relate. This semester, Latin GSEP is working on a variety of projects related to the theme of alternity, such as our new publication named Patio. Patio welcomes submissions from all creators with a focus on Latin America subjects. We invite you to submit any project, provocation, interview, or imagination that you have created that addresses the theme of alternity in a Latin America context. For more information and submission guidelines, please check Patio's website and Instagram account the links you will be able to find in the Zoom chat. The events in the conversation series are co-created with Professor Anna Ditch, co-sponsored by GSAP and the Institute for Latin American Studies as supported by Columbia Global Center Rio and Santiago. The series will continue to explore the umbrella theme of authority after tonight's event. Our last event is the keynote conversation led by Professor Anna Ditch on authority and the third landscape on December 1st. So tonight we would like to welcome you and our panelists, Ines Mendez and Greg Melitonov from Taller Ken, Jessica Carrera and Mariana Grajales from Comuna Taller, and Diana Wisner. Tonight's event aims to bring forth the Latin American urbanization process that produced dramatic ramifications of unnatural and human patterns in the region. Inviting practices working in Latin America allows the conversation to be ingrained in the specificity of the localities bringing forth the discussion around identity. The panelists will share case studies and examples from their authorship to guide the conversation towards a dialogue of synergies, possibilities, ruptures, and tensions of the urban space. So tonight's event, uh, tonight's moderators include myself, Osvaldo Dobre, born and raised in Bayamon, Puerto Rico study architecture in San Juan and is now in his second year in Master of Architecture program. Uh, also joining us is Juan Moreno, born and raised in Bogota, Colombia. Juan is an urban historian with master's degree in geography and is currently pursuing his master's in urban planning. So we, we're gonna present uh, Tayer Ken, uh, Gregory, uh, Meli Tonov and Ines Guzman met when they were working in uh, Florenzo Piano as part of the design team for the Whitney Museum of American Arts and the offices of, uh, for the High Line. Uh, and they founded Tayerken in 2013. Um, and their practice is based in New York City and Guatemala. Uh, their work includes mixed use development, residential projects, and installation design. Um, they also founded Fundamental in 2016 as a sort of mirror practice. Um, it's a nonprofit which allows them to expand beyond the limits of their um, of commercial contracts to explore topics of environmental systems um, within urban landscapes, uh, social, economic, and physical barriers between communities through the process of building uh, or engaging the next generation of architects and designers in the narrative. Um, they have um, been recognized or included in, in as one of six firms, including, uh, sorry, the AIA NY uh, has included uh, Tayer Ken as uh, the recipient of its New Practices New York 2016 award. <clears throat> Our next um, guest, Comunal Tayer, was founded in 2015 by Me in Mexico City by Mariano Ordonez Grajales. And it was shortly after joined by Jessica Amescua Carreras in 2017. Comunal is a team made up of women committed to encouraging and facilitating the participation of adult women, young people, and girls in all their projects and processes developed together with the communities. Uh, they focus on respecting 
and valuing the contributions made by women in strategic, administrative, and constructive processes, always respecting their cultural context through a participatory design approach. They have been recognized by multiple awards um, for their work by various organizations, such as the Architectural League of New York for Emerging Voices in 2018. And they have also participated in the Venice Biennale Free Space with the Mexican pavilion Echoes of the Land of a Land in 2018, among other recognitions. And uh, last but not least, uh, as a fellow Bogotano, I get to introduce Diana Wiesner. Diana is a landscape architect from Bogota, Colombia, where she founded her practice in urban ecology and social management. She's also the founder and director of Fundación Cerros de Bogotá, which was created in 2009. Through this foundation and her, and her architecture practice, she has highlighted the close relationship between the Colombian capital and the mountains of, that frame the urban landscape in the, easter, in the eastern portion of the city. In 2007, she directed El Camino de los Cerros, a groundbreaking document published by Bogotá's planning department. Diana has also received a variety of awards and international biennials. Some of her recent awards include for the first place in the next Green Awards, uh, awarded in 2016 in Los Angeles. Uh, so finally, before we uh, give the room to our panelists, uh, each panelist will be presenting from around five to seven minutes, and we will follow up by opening the floor for conversations and questions from the public. So please feel free to send your questions in the chat or to us personally. Um, with that, uh, Tayer can, can start. Okay. Um, so we're gonna try to talk quick because there's two of us. Um, but uh, my name is Gregory Malatanov and Ines Guzman is my partner. And uh, um, I'm from, uh, we kind of have this uh, spirit of alterity baked into our practice. I'm from New York and Ines is originally from Guatemala. And a lot of our work, hopefully you can see the screen okay. Uh, a lot of the work sort of um, reflects this uh, outsider approach. Um, this is one of our first projects, uh, which is a, a cafe that was one of the first projects we made after working for Renzo's office, where we were both, uh, Ines was kind of coming back to Guatemala after quite a long time away living in Costa Rica. And it was for me an entirely new uh, culture and experience. And um, so our first kind of, um, you know, impressions as, as uh, somebody from outside discovering a new country in, in Central America is really the degree in which the indigenous population um, uh, exists in uh, overlaid onto all the kind of cultural traditions. And so it was almost natural for us to be um, sort of have blinders on um, to these traditions that really don't exist in the places we're used to working. So we kind of um, isolated and exaggerated them to um, kind of uh, remix these cultural traditions that people locally are very familiar with, but to us were very new and exciting um, in kind of a way that made a new and refreshing space. Um, but as we kind of grew into um, being more, um, sort of our studio grew and our opportunities grew and we became sort of more fluid in the language of the, the culture. Uh, we, we sort of started to realize that uh, Central America, Guatemala is not a monolith um, and that it's really part of a, a developing culture, a developing economy and a lot of global forces um, intersect. So this is a project that kind of speaks to that where uh, we kind of were overlaying a lot of these colors and textures and patterns and local tradi traditions and letting some of those um, isolations uh, blur and, and kind of mix a little bit along with bringing out um, issues of um, sort of uh, sustainability. So, um, sorry, I'm just blitzing through because uh, we maybe didn't uh, account for such a short presentation. 
but essentially uh, these are these are kind of some of the typical scenes that we were used to working with where there's this heavily globalized commercialized context and so we we wanted to create something that both um, reacted to that context in a very artistic way uh, in a very commercial way and kind of fed into that culture but also tried to turn it on its head and create you know an interior world an interior ideal oasis sort of riffing on um, sort of passive sustainable practices water collection and develop a very sensory experience um, again overlaying all these patterns colors and textures and then um, we also started sort of leveraging all of our um, experience working with um, local craftspeople. I'm sure it'll come up in the discussion about working in Latin America really gives the opportunity to um, work in ways that are a little more spontaneous, improvisational and, and temporal. So uh, we created, as was mentioned at the outset, we created Fundamental which was a chance for us to really um, do a design build project and sort of um, try to address some of the public space issues that we saw that, that just didn't really come through as we were working for commercial clients. And uh, that program invites international students down to Central America f at the time um, for uh, a period of three months intensive to uh, do a project from concept to um, uh, to construction in three months. So everything is uh, done using um, donated funds, uh, donated materials, and um, and a mix of students of different ages from universities in different parts of the world. So this was the first um, iteration of that, which is uh, a Playa Chomo. It's a sort of an installation at the base of a public. Uh, the National Theater, which is a green space in the city, which was really falling into disrepair and being underused. So we were trying to bring more uh, voices to the table and it ended up being used as uh, running a Saturday children's program. And we expanded that, that program as our studio has also expanded beyond just Guatemala. We expanded that program into um, Costa Rica. Uh, Florence, who's on the call, was uh, part of this team where again, we sort of tackled a, um, uh, a brownfield site next to a transportation rail line where it was just sort of an underused public space and allowed us to um, spin out from that um, uh, a narrative uh, about engaging, engaging with local community participants and kind of building, I think the, the, the tagline for this was blurring boundaries. So, uh, the, the, the design installation was meant to sort of blur boundaries between um, sort of different social groups uh, and different communities that we found on site. Um, so this is uh, using um, bamboo poles that are painted and given a, um, a reflective uh, tape. Again, uh, the project typically does um, a lot of low tech, high impact work because it's using donated and recycled materials, but at night it, it acts as a giant light installation. During the day, it's, it's sort of more of a children's playground, uh, which is made of these mounds, which are used um, using recycled tires and a kind of gravel, um, which makes a natural water filtration. And I'll uh, maybe say this one for the Q&A, but the, uh, the team for the sort of most recent iteration of the project, which is in Tapachula, Mexico. So we've partnered with this uh, group from CUNY, uh, who is um, sort of leading the design for this uh, uh, theater attached to a uh, civic cultural center. Uh, and so this is, this is kind of like the new iteration. It'll be the first time we do it in Mexico. Uh, so it's very exciting to kind of be um, growing this organization uh, as, as sort of our studio continues to grow and evolve. Thanks. I'll stop sharing the screen. And great timing. No, it's perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just cut out Ines and it all worked great. <laughs> <laughs> She'll talk a lot in the q &A. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Now we're gonna follow with Comunal. 
Jessica, if you want to share the screen. Yes, let me share. Okay. Yeah. Can you view my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, Mariana was not able to be here. Uh, we're sorry that it's just one of us, but uh, right now she's traveling to one of the communities where we are working. So I will try to speak as, as better as I can to try to explain uh, our work. Um, well, uh, in Mexico, we have a, a vast territory with a great environmental and cultural diversity integrated by 68 indigenous groups, each of them with their own way of understanding the world, inhabiting the territory and producing architecture. Despite this, the public policies of our country are completely disconnected from the reality that exists in rural communities, since through their federal programs have imposed their own agenda based on the annulment, homogenization, and industrialization of the ways of living. In our country and in Latin America, we are standing before a panorama of social, cultural, economic, and territorial crisis that requires to rethink our role as architects. It is in this context that we question ourselves. How do public policies affect our territory and culture? What is the role of the architect in, the, in view of the problems that native peoples have faced for decades? The first and second exercises of the project Social Production of Housing, located in the Northeast Sierra of Puebla, were developed through participatory processes with the residents of the community. Both projects aim to demonstrate that the qualitative and quantitative properties of housing can be improved with local construction, knowledge, and local materials as part of the design project. In spite of the collective effort of integrated research processes, knowledge sharing, technical training, workshops, assemblies, and self-construction based on mutual aid, the first exercise was invalidated by the National Housing Commission, Conadi. Since its, regulations and con since its regulations consider vernacular materials such as palm, bamboo, earth, and wood as precarious and inadequate. So how can native peoples preserve their, their habitat when they are forced to use industrialized materials outside their ways of living? How can they preserve their constructive culture? Again, this, against this background, we carried out a second exercise in collaboration with the Union of Indigenous Cooperatives, Tose Pantitatanisque, in which we proposed a mixed constructive system with the objective of gaining access to federal housing subsidies and of preserving the use of bamboo in walls and roofing. The project was awarded in the first national rural housing competition organized by the same government agency. However, they expressed that these winning models could not be replicated by building companies nor real estate developers. So they were considered a failure. Again, housing was seen as a market product and not as a human right. The most significant achievement of the housing exercises was not in public policy, but in the young people of Tepetzinta, who from the technical training workshops that took place in their community and their need to have a dignified educational space, decided to design and self-build their own school. The concept productive rural school emerged from five participatory design workshops with the students who expressed the need to rethink the way of teaching and learning in rural communities by proposing an architectural program culturally appropriate to their reality and needs. The project is focused on the rescue of traditional knowledge and crafts as well as the preservation of their mother tongue Nahuatl in order to detonate productive chains that prevent the migration and disintegration of families in the community. This conceptualization would not have been possible from our imaginary and personal experience. Here is the relevance of the dialogue and participation under equal conditions. Today, due to the collective work and community contributions, we are about to finish the second stage of construction. Although the project has not been completed, the new school has tripled the number of students enrolled it is serving seven communities in the region that months ago didn't have access to high school and is improving the life conditions of, and opportunities of young women by integrating them, integrating them to local productive chains. While the Tepetzinten community was celebrating the opening of the school in 2017, a series of earthquakes affected the states of Oaxaca, Chiapas, Morelas, and Puebla, entities with the greatest rural population in our country. 
A few months later, at the earthquakes, we were convened by the Ixtepecan Committee for the Defense of Life and Territory and the University of the Earth to carry out a participatory action research process about local ways of inhabiting, recovering and improving traditional housing, and also to design a new housing model that could dialogue with the collective memory of the Zapotec peoples of Oaxaca. The diagnostic and participatory design sessions were held with 20 women affected by the earthquakes, who expressed the most important aspects in terms of rebuilding their homes, the relations between function spaces, and the different scenarios for the project progressive growth. This allowed us to develop a decision-making tool that responded in a flexible way to the particular needs of, the, of each family. Subsequently, this analysis was translated into a new participatory tool with which families designed their own reconstruction housing. This led to 25 different project, projects with, which rescued the traditional way of inhabiting the place and at the same time considered the needs and particularities of each family. The constructive system of the housing model responds to the natural and local materials available as well as to the demand of the families to carry out the reconstruction of their home through assisted self-construction processes. For this reason, the model consists of compact earth blocks that the families can produce and assemble during the construction process, thus promoting new productive change in the community. Currently, the project is financed with public, pol public resources to the federal reconstruction program, and has recognized it as a pilot project of social and participatory architecture to transform public housing policies in the country. The integrative perspective that participation, interculturality, and alterity share supposes the ability to communicate with the other from the knowledge and understanding of their culture. In this regard, we rely on different dynamics of participatory processes that enable us to open the dialogue and integrate the different perspectives of actors and users of the project. This democratic and integrated vision has led us to perform social dynamics with different tools. One of them has been participatory models which attempt to, to directly integrate users in the design of the project. Such is the case of the Childbirth Houses project carried out in conjunction with the network of uh, Saltal Midwives Un Solo Corazón, which aims to reduce the maternal infant mortality rate uh, in the indigenous region of Los Alto de Chiapas. Because the midwife did not have the technical constructive knowledge, we developed in conjunction with the young team of architects Armando Casas, a participatory tool that allowed us to design together and break the language barrier between Saltal and Spanish. The design of the instrument and its components is based on the understanding of the place, the traditional typologies and the vernacular constructive systems, which help the midwives recognize the forms and proportions of the possible project solutions. During this exercise, we could, we could observe that the midwives could solve almost immediately the functioning of the space because they know the particular needs of their location. However, they found difficulties in the technical constructive aspects. On the contrary, when the husbands participated in the sessions, we recognized that it was much easier to solve the constructive system first since men are used to build the vernacular house in the Seltal communities. This dynamic showed how gender roles and our life experience modify the way we perceive, understand, and do architecture. From our work, we approach architectural practice based on the values and principles of the concept social production of habitat, whose notion understands the habitat as a social and cultural product that implies the active, informed, and organized participation of the inhabitants in the management and development of its environment. For the above, we turn to the democratic vision of participatory architecture, where it is recognized that individuals from any social cultural context have the capacity to identify their needs and generate strategies for the improvement of life conditions. In this sense, participatory architecture leads to respect all forms of life and to conceive our practice as a social process that is interrelated with technical and local understanding in order to enhance the exchange of collective knowledge from where decision-making is carried out through a constant process of dialogue. Finally, our practice is related to a constant exercise of denunciation, democracy, social justice, and defense of human rights, through which we advocate the construction of an inclusive, collaborative, and congruent society where inhabitants are recognized as subjects of action and not as objects of intervention, 
with the potential and responsibility of influencing the public policies of our country and therefore the historical reality of the communities. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. And last, Diana. Diana, you, you're muted. muted. Diana, you're unmuted. You're muted, so I just asked you to unmute. Thank there you. you. Go. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. The screen is black. Is that right? No. Maybe. Yeah, here we see the presentation. Um, it's full screen. Do you see the first slide? No. Oh. Maybe try share screen. So it's the top left. It's okay. Perfect. Yes. <clears throat> okay. I want to begin with a concept from Leonardo Boff, which is a philosopher. Citizens is Citizenship is derived from city and floristy from forest or jungle. Forest and human being live a socio-ecological pact with the forest becomes a new citizen respected in his integrity, stability, and extraordinary beauty. The logic of mutuality is assumed, which implies mutual respect and synergy. We are called us Floristines. In times of compulsory quarantine, we, citizens of Bogota, have had to look to the hills again. The over 13 hectares of the eastern hills seem unperturbed by what is happening in the city, in the country, in the world. It seems as if this piece of the Andes mountain is statically watching over the life of its inhabitants. The country's capital is a privileged city and it's surrounded by a majestic mountain range, a set of moorlands, peaks, and multiple water courses that have unfortunately been bare and it's inaccessible, affected to this, its inhabitants. In its this low access is a subject of reflection and action. We assume ourselves as citizens in the high plain tropical forest in the region of Bogota. We extend this type of citizenship inter retro connected into a new civilizing narrative. In an area of transition between the city and the forest reserve, we promote ways to relating to others and nature in urban rural peace process within a city of more than 8 million inhabitants in a country that it is still trying to understand what this means on a national scale, in a country that hasn't learned how to live with the forest. That is why we are agents of peace. During this year, which has been full of uncertainties, we and, and the passion of our group of Florestanios added to the fears derived from the scarcity of opportunities generated a challenge of creation and intense movement. The quarantine, which has been just lived in Bogota, show the impact in the pandemic that has had on the street, on business, on meeting places. And we can now see ourselves almost hidden behind our masks, walking at a different piece of life. Despite this landscape, life buzzes in the Eastern hills. Apart from the importance of the very existence, the hills are also subjects of reinvention. Coinciding to our 11th birthday, we decided to launch the campaign, The Hill Save Us, 
to highlight the vital and protective role of the hills from the city. A need that become more evident in these times of pandemic and quarantine. In these six months, we have worked intensely to launch also the largest platform and complete on formation, people, flora, fauna, moors, water basin, citizen initiatives, projects, children, uh, uh, children's uh, projects, food packs, historical studies, neighborhood studies. The citizens are able to take the hills on their homes because we are drawing designs uh, in the process, learn the names, the top toponyms and the sacred places. As Florentines citizens, we have witnessed the changes that have altered the ecosystem of our hills. And perhaps pretentiously, we have always said that the mountain need us for restoration. We made plans and talk about how necessary these actions are to recover the biodiversity lost by the construction of the city. But we have breathed the fresh air. We have rediscovered the landscape and now we do realize that it's not we who will save the hills, but they are the ones that can save us. In the light of the current crisis, the need from green spaces in urban environments for us and for the whole world has become evident. However, in other cities, perhaps in too many, the deficiency and safe and accessible green spaces affect the improvement of physical and mental health of communities and become evident. The pressure from citizens to walk the trials, the trails, uh, we hear the, the children voices and show the acute need for natural spaces without congestion. It is precisely in this scenario that we that has motivated us to insist the possibility of building a shared vision and a comprehensive management of the city Eastern Hills. We have in, involved the children in this, uh, in this uh, process. We are now doing our plan from our, from our cities and we are dreaming about creating a social ecological corridor that restores existing trails with native species we dream also that we have a neighborhood paths that will train guides and share stories about their ethnobotanic, their geology, and their environmental stories and lookouts, among other species. This affectionate and productive coexistence is already becoming a reality in a living and a very small living laboratory that we have created that we call Umbral Cultural Horizontes. Here, with the collaboration of volunteers, experts, experts and people, we make collaborative restoration with native species, orchids, and composing process that have been carried out, as these as a, a circular economy with the residuals from the, from the people. And we want to replicate this model to have a private property for public use. The natural reserve acts as a laboratory of collaborative transformation and through a volunteer program, we have carrying a participant restoration from five years. We also generate collective works such as a collective Lorraine, we produce land art and offer week, weekly talks on urban ecology called Catedra Cerros Bogotá, in which the mountain takes the stage. This, log, this work is long and has not been easy. We are discouraged by the lack of resources and frustrated by the low echo of our activities. We are also overwhelmed by the reality we live in our country, the violence, the attack on environmental leaders, the increase of poverty, and the generalized pain in a country that resists change. A country in which this year we have lost more than 80,000 hectares of forest. However, our hope is still alive and we remain motivated to contribute our 
little piece of peace of the light in this beloved corner of the hills of Bogota. Thank you. Thank you for all the panelists for the presentation. Uh, we will now start opening up the conversation. So feel free to add questions in the chat or raise your hand, you can ask uh, personally too, uh, in English, Spanish, Portuguese. Uh, we have all the languages here so we can help translating. And then maybe to start the conversation. So we wanted to touch upon a question that for all the panelists, so we created the conversation through the lens of scale. So thinking of architecture from urban furniture to installations to infrastructure ecosystems. So the question of scale has a direct co correlation to spheres of public and community spaces. So we would like to ask if you could talk a little bit how the manipulation of scale in your design approach it starts to dialogue to democratic spaces. Alice, who did you ask the question to? Uh, to all of the panelists. Mm. What, was it clear what Alice asked? It was a yes. very long question. <laughs> it was a little bit uh, quickly. I, if you can repeat the last part. Yes, uh, so the last part of the question is how manipulation of different scales can um, inform democratic spaces since um, the, the conversation was created a lot of the reason was the different approaches of design from Dayakan, Comunal and yours so the question is from all those scale from ecosystem to uh, mm -hmm. urban furniture. Yes I can begin. Um, uh, we have I haven't shown my work in a as landscape architect, but um, like 13 years ago, I proposed a plan for the mountains of Bogota, and it was very published, and uh, uh, it was excellent for the people. But there was no political priority for the for the mountains of Bogota. So we began as uh, activists uh, 11 years ago, and um, at that time, I remember not being very comprehensive about my plan uh, with the, with the, uh, very um, precise examples. But now that we have this a little laboratory, uh, we are in the small scale, we are doing a work with the people, we are making the pact with the, with the neighborhoods, we are working with the people and people is understanding what we were proposing 11 years ago. So now uh, we have more, be more, um, resonancia. we have more resonance in, in mm -hmm. our narrative. So that big scale and big picture that we have clear from the planning, uh, we are now putting in a very little, like a, a control mm -hmm. point, and it's giving more results. And we are having many little points in different parts of um, citizens' initiatives that have a complete this big plan. So these different scales have been worked in, at the same time in more effectively. Uh, well, I can, I can continue. Um, in our case, um, uh, we always work with the with the different scales. Like since the research, since the research work, where where we try to approach every project uh, through a moment of participatory research with the community about the understanding of the place that it includes how uh, 
it, it, it includes the systemic view of the community about their territory and how this territory is interrelated with their ways of living and the problems or the potentials that this place can give uh, to the community. So um, we always uh, try to go to the large scale, to the small scale, and every, every time it is connected. Um, in the rural communities, everything is interrelated in the ways of the, how the natural resources um, give the pattern uh, for the spatial, uh, for the spatial um, uh, architecture, and also it gives uh, the materials. Uh, the nature is interrelated also with the with the time where people of the community can cut uh, the wood and can, or can have uh, some uh, water or can have uh, some materials for the renovation of their houses. So. Any architectural project that uh, we try to make in collaboration with the communities, we always have to be um, to interrelate uh, all the scales from one from one place to another. So every time we have to work with um, with a large, medium, and small scale. So maybe in our case, um, and I would like to invite our team from Tapachula to join the conversation, but uh, the fundamental initiative is basically talking about democracy on the side of um, architecture or even processes that emerge from the collective imagination. And uh, we're, we're, it's everyone that's participating. It's not just the students, it's not just uh, Tayer Ken, it's the community, the place, the selection, everything. So that, that's our approach to democracy, a very complicated term these days, I say. <laughs> I, I have a question to maybe bring together um, what both Tayer uh, Ken and Comunal shared with us, which is that in your approach to these uh, local cultural traditions, uh, which include, of course, uh, local knowledge, local constructive knowledge, you are uh, transforming in an almost uh, alchemical process, intangibles, uh, and in, in this process, it seems that materials have uh, a critical role to play. So uh, can you share with us a little bit more of your experiences with materials in, uh, as a tool to uh, uh, construct these mm -hmm. spaces and to intervene in these, in these local scales? Yes, also maybe it can be related with the question that, so, that Candelaria put uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, our view about the, the local materials if that is, is that uh, we never introduce a new material that is not local. For example, like uh, not because it is a natural material, it's good to introduce it in a place where that material does not exist. For example, uh, bamboo. No? Uh, bamboo is placed only in special ecosystems and, and we only use it when that is one of the um, most repetitive uh, um, natural material in the area. So that is why the first approach is to try to have an understanding of the natural resources and which are the natural um, materials with which the communities have been building uh, for a long, long time uh, in traditional ways. And also if the, that knowledge is still available in the community because sometimes in some communities, they have been uh, in a process of urbanization and many of the local knowledge have vanished. So uh, the first thing that we have to do is to try to see uh, if the natural resources are still available. Like in some places, some of the materials have almost gone because also this uh, development and this process of urbanization uh, and also because of deforestation, etc and also to see if uh, what is the local knowledge about these building systems. With that information uh, related with the ecosystem and also related with the aspiration of the community about the project, 
we try to uh, um, build uh, more than a, pro a design project. It is more like try to build a uh, community strategies with which um, um, we can uh, have the potential of the natural resources, but also the knowledge of the community that can be also uh, under understood as related also with the local economy. So everything we try to also not to understand the place with a systemic view, but also to try to um, build um, strategies also with that systemic view so that everything can be in a, in a, I don't know how to say it in English, in English, but like in this, uh, el circulo virtuoso, no, de todas las cosas. Um, I don't know if I, um, I if you want, uh, if you want to add uh, something that you want her to touch upon. Um, yes, well, our approach is very much hands on and uh, do it yourself and um, make it happen. So we basically work with what we find, what we get donated and hopefully things that we can reuse that are um, either unused, abandoned, or for example, the project, uh, the Playa Chomo, the one that we presented first was made out of elastic, um, elastic material that was leftovers from a factory that produces all these elastic bands for uh, Victoria's Secret and Adidas, and then they export it. And basically what we found is that they, they didn't need it. They were probably gonna burn it or who knows. And this material has had already three uses. The first one was the project itself. Then a uh, fashion designer collected some of, of, of the one we had and designed sandals with it. And then it was used for marking paths in the um, in the ravines of Guatemala City. I think there's like a, an interesting thing because you have a um, dynamic where um, sometimes in a developing com country where the wealth is they're interested in um, external standards of quality and so there's a look outside of the country's borders to try to raise standards of expectation and is turning a blind eye to what's local but um, a lot of times our clients are commissioning us um, to do something and they want something like what they see in the magazine but the, the the materials and furnishings are all imported and that increases their price three times so for the same amount of money you can do something that's completely um, one of a kind custom using traditional crafts and materials, which keeps the money uh, flow local and also allows, um, there's, there's also a kind of, um, I would say a, um, a sort of whittling down of the traditional um, application to groups that aren't in the indigenous communities. So they find something that sells like a mask and then they, learn how to make the mask and make it on repeat because it's something that can be kind of um, put into markets that may start to dilute its actual cultural significance as a commercial product. So we're trying to also find opportunities to um, see, where, see where the craftsmanship is there, but maybe the integrity has sometimes gone away um, so that we can, we can kind of help to refresh. And it's something that's very common and uh, we work um, also with a lot of um, local product designers, local artists, uh, Ines mentioned local fashion designers, who are all sort of trying to reimagine um, this, this blended culture in, in the same way and sort of see, see things through a new, new lens uh, and embrace some of the sort of, again, the sort of global reality uh, and not segregate these things as much as they have been in the past. I have a comment, um, more than a question, but um, um, when I was um, listening to, um, um, I, I forget your name because you have Como Now only. Uh, it's Jessica. Jessica. Um, 
So when you were talking about the difficulty of, of using the indigenous traditional and natural um, materials, I mean, I've encountered that also in Brazil, like when we're working, especially working in the Amazon and places where, you know, obviously um, th those are the materials that, you know, were traditionally used. There's also the question of temporality, right? A lot of the indigenous um, and um, indigenous, indigenous ethnicities and also local, um, you know, white folks that have been there traditionally for a long time um, have, um, have dwellings that are supposed to, to last a certain amount of time, right? Um, so when you start um, trying to connect um, those ways of living, it's not just a question of materials, right? It's a, it's a question of how they live. Um, to some kind of policy, which is usually unified and 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 just you know for the whole country, right? And if we consider, you know, the Amazon, um, the legal Amazon itself, not only Brazil, it's the size of the U.S., right? So that's already crazy. If you consider consider then Brazil and the other countries around the the forest, I mean, it's it's just crazy. And we have like one policy. Um, right. So one thing that I started um, thinking, and I think um, a while ago, and I think now is 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 a time that maybe it will make more sense. Um, it does make more sense already in the U.S. and maybe in Latin America, if we start going um, down this path, could make sense in some years. Is if we to affect policy, we start demanding. Um, the calculus um, as a guideline um, for private financing and public financing um, about the um, carbon footprint of materials. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is something that, you know, I, I, we, we have tried to start with the private sector in Brazil. And it's mm -hmm. now like, you know, some people are starting to kind of like want to discuss this. But I just like something that you know occurred to me because you're never going to converge the two things. Um, mm -hmm. they, you know, they 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 they're just like coming from two different parallel imaginaries. They're not going to converge. Mm -hmm. So, um, just a thought. Uh, also, Candelaria had a question for Comunal. If you wanna expand. Yeah, I think that, that the theme about the public policies is also related with that question. Um, uh, we have all also been working on that path, no? trying to fight also with the public policies, uh, trying to demonstrate, not us, but also a lot of civil organization in, in Latin America and, and in Mexico, trying to, to fight public policies and make them understand um, the the simple view that they are they are having about habitat no that they are only seeing the quantitative uh, aspect but not the qualitative aspect and also that that way of much of homogenization of solutions through all the territory also in mexico we have only one public policy about housing about the materials when you have a lot of ecosystems a lot of um, indigenous cultures so we have all also been working on that path and it has been uh, very difficult like in the past 10 years, but um, the, with this government, some things have changed uh, that, are tr that are a little bit closer to, to try to understand um, uh, the great potential of local materials and also of local knowledge and also of local economy to have much better um, houses, much better community spaces. And also, we also try to use um, our work to, to set like a kind of example to demonstrate all the potential that it's around uh, of working with the community, not working, uh, not making the project to the community, no? So it, it is a, a long way and maybe we will not see in our lifetime uh, the effect, but I think that it's very important that the communities also try to have this reflection, not only the professionals, but the communities by themselves to have this reflection. So they can also be, uh, they can be organized and try to defend um, 
their natural resources and their ways of living and try to have uh, a path more of autonomy than of dependency. You know? So I think that the reflection process is a very important part also of our work to try not to change just our own minds, but also uh, try to make a reflective process in the communities. And um, Candelaria was also asking uh, if the, we have seen the effect of these construction methods that we're working with the communities. These are not methods that are co-created. Like wh what we try to do is to try to re reinforce the local knowledge about the local materials. And with, the te with technical knowledge, we try to improve some of these systems so that they can last longer so they can be replicated in the same region. Um, and one of the examples is uh, the productive rural school that is like the third project that we made in Sierra Oriental de Puebla after the first uh, exercises. So the local knowledge about the first two exercises of housing uh, was taken from the, com uh, was took from the community to implement it in the construction of the rural, rural school. So uh, now we don't have to be there so that the people can uh, also uh, use those, that knowledge was, that was over there, but they just needed a simple uh, change uh, or a modification or an, a simple improvement of how to use the bamboo. So it can be a local material with the potential to construct everything that they want to construct. To build, sorry. Uh, Luis Carranza, you had a question in the chat. Do you want to ask uh, personally or do you want me to read? You can read it. I think you read perfectly. <laughs> I could ask it. It doesn't matter. And that's why I just put it in the chat, but it doesn't matter. I can read it or you can read it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I was curious, um, all of the presenters, uh, I'm going to read the, the, the question, all the presenters talked about different forms of spontaneous practices in some form or another, um, either ways of working that seem to subvert or question standardized modes of production, um, traditional or uh, expected modes uh, or, or forms of spatial occupation, and the use of materials that are not typically associated with the production of space. In light of uh, communal struggle with Infonavit that seem to reject practices that don't fit into the kind of globalized modes of production mm -hmm. or market marketability. What is the role generally of your practices uh, to make the critical character of these spontaneous practices acceptable mm -hmm. to become, in other words, more widespread, especially in locations that uh, where the governing structures strive towards modernization and further globalization. How is it that these things that seem to be very much kind of rooted in the place that seem to be kind of anathema to a kind of a sense of um, globalization and modernization, how do we make these things so that they become kind of acceptable and part of a kind of a, a, a structure of kind of solu uh, like solving the problems that are at hand? Mm -hmm. um, we try to, to break with this idea of what the architect should be. No, like we try to get out of the box about thinking just about the design or maybe something about the, the space uh, or the materials, but we try to, in, in Espanol, we call it uh, acompañamiento social e integral. It's like to, to be together, to be next to the people, to give them, to, to try to collaborate. It's not like in a vertical um, way of working, it's an horizontal view of our work where we have to uh, understand uh, as much as possible all the technical, uh, social, and the territorial um, uh, problems that we have in face. And also we try to put more our energy, not only in the design, but mostly in the design of the strategies, not of the projects, not of the spaces, because we think that like the architecture will be the result, no, or, or, or also, and, and also that architecture can be the way by which um, the reflection in the communities can uh, help a lot more um, uh, to the oncoming uh, years. So, and also we try to break with the idea of the short term. We try to think much more in the long term and sometimes it's a little bit difficult also with when you are working with 
um, with public resources because that, sometimes it's impossible. Now, nowadays, we're in a very huge problem with Konabi because they want us to build very quickly on the houses. And this kind, this approach is completely different. No? The most important thing is the social process and the architecture will be the result. And the architecture will, 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 will show uh, if the social process was the appropriate or if it was just like a construction process of a real estate, no? So we try to break all that things that in our school we were, we were uh, teach, <laughs> uh, we try to get out of that idea. And that is, that is why we um, have this concept, uh, we, we follow this concept of social production of habitat that was, um, um, we, it was thought since the 60s, uh, uh, it, was, it has been placed in Latin America uh, a long time ago, like 60 years ago, you know, to this kind of work. I want also to contribute, I think in, in our case, um, we have many plans and many uh, perspectives about the city and how we relate with the, with the borders. Of, and I have studied many examples and many plans that we have, we have done in Bogota. And uh, we have seen that it is easier for, an, for a mayor to uh, construct in infrastructure and to do it in a, uh, any kind of, uh, of formal use. But, but we, we have, um, and I agree with uh, Jessica, because we thought that we need this like agreement with the people and how they, how they relate with the nature and the borders and how they uh, relate with life, with all the expressions of life, the soil, no? You, 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 you don't realize uh, how do you think about what is happening in the soil and what is all the processes and, and with the water and with all the things that are having a relation and a, an incredible process that we can imagine. So um, we try that, we try to, to do uh, something that it, it could be invisible because it's work with the people. It, we are create, creating relationships we are creating a new way of uh, relating to others and you cannot see it in infrastructure. It is going to see it in a long time. That's why we are talking that we are having another way of relating urban and rural areas in a huge uh, city. So sometimes maybe not the obvious, um, Mm, solution that we have been learned about planning or designing, but uh, the invisible lines that we have to cross to change things. Um, on our end, I think uh, it's very similar to what Jessica mentioned, and uh, because it's more about bringing the people together. Uh, in our case, the people we're talking, especially about the students and to be exposed to processes and experimentation and dealing with, with communities, governments, uh, almost as sort of not asking permission to do something, which is also part of the what you mentioned to be more spontaneous. And we limit it to a three month project in order to, to not, not make something that could potentially happen in three years or a long-term vision, but something that would happen really fast that generates uh, probably a, a fast uh, impact in the place where it's happening, but especially a strong impact on architecture students and uh, more and more we're working with other students. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, is. Uh, getting out of the box and uh, sort of breaking the rules in a way and following other rules, but it's less about the outcome and more about the process and the people. I think also um, what we uh, run up against is a lot of entrenched thinking. And so um, getting sort of the municipalities or getting um, sponsor companies. A lot of times we work in places where everyone knows what the problems are. Um, they don't need that outside the box 
um, thinking they need to be shown the way. And so we're typically parachuting in and quickly offering to create a piece of public art to really break log jams that already exist with a lot of um, people on the ground doing good work, uh, community organizing or working um, in some cases in preserving um, uh, either like railway lines or urban waterways and things like that. But there just seems to be, uh, they've, they've all seemed to read a, a reached a point of inertia. And so using art and design in a kind of low risk, high impact way is a great way to show people like, look, there are possibilities if you just get something going. And that's allowed us to kind of blitz through a lot of um, kind of typical processes. And, uh, and that's, been, that's been very refreshing. And also um, to, to sort of the previous question, I think that there's something about um, fostering kind of like the architecture equivalent of a slow, slow food movement that needs to happen. There needs to be top-down appreciation of design in order for people to, to see its value. Um, so as much as I, we do kind of work ground up in terms of bringing everyone to the table possible, it's also about um, enriching people's lives in the public through design. I think Maru has a question. Yeah, I was gonna ask, it's, it kind of speaks to, to what we were talking, but keeping in the theme of scale, how can you plan for your initiatives to scale up? And this is addressed to all, this, to all the speakers. So not really scale up in size, um, quite literally, but scaling in replication and in impact. So how can we design as students and as architects um, for initiatives to grow in scale. So since many of the designs that you presented today are more than what gets built, they're an initiative to create community and they're like the idea that could scale up. At least for our fundamental initiative, uh, we kind of took the COVID opportunity to, to spin it out um, so one of the teams, um, for the first time, we're running three parallel projects um, rather than one per year. Uh, so that was a step that we took because we recognize that even if it's successful, as successful as it's been, it just has limitations if it stays the way it is. So we've tried to create um, a program that can be kind of offloaded in terms of a methodology rather than you know, again, design that always points back to some office, right? In our case, um, we make this um, um, laboratory in the mountain where the mountain speaks. And we try to, this is a private uh, space. And we are trying to say to the municipality that they don't have to buy all the land to have this social ecological corridor in the mountains of Bogota. And they are planning that the first stage is to, to, to pay for all the land, that it's extremely complicated. So we are trying to make an example and a scale of repl replication that a private uh, place can be public use. And we can do all the things that we are doing in the process of having a new way of basing that and a, we, a new way of relating with others uh, with this little laboratory. So we, we think this, um, they, are, they are hearing this proposal to change their politics. I think Maru, that is a very great question because if we try to to be just ourselves, the ones that are trying to change something outside, nothing is going to happen. So the word of replication, it's one of the one of our most our um, um, the, one of the things that we're always thinking about. So for us, I think that the the key word is uh, knowledge knowledge sharing. 
because if if the, in those process where you are working with the community in either project that you are working, um, you do not make like those participatory research processes. You do not make these reflective processes with the community. You do not make these. Uh, training workshops where there is uh, this no lecturing from either from both sides, no, not just from the technicians to the community, but also to the, from the community to the technicians. Um, then um, anything new will be burned for, um, uh, burned from that, no. So um, uh, we think that one of the most important things that we have to do is to try to. Um, to potentiate this um, knowledge sharing through different processes no, in every part of the project so that at the end it will not be necessary uh, for us to to continue working with the community no uh, so they can we do not um, uh, we do not uh, have so the community do not have a dependency on our work but they can have the autonomy to replicate the projects with their own, with the knowledge that they are acquired uh, together. No? So um, if there is no knowledge sharing, they will have to be uh, as dependent as, as in the time where, where we arrive. And also I just want to try to also say that um, uh, participation and the local knowledge is always uh, their participation do not start when we start working with the, with the community. Always, all, always the community have some kinds of participation and some knowledge and some um, uh, uh, local view of the ways of making the project. So we are just like one of the actors that are trying to collaborate in that uh, objective and with that community. Uh, but um, we are just one part of all the actors that are a uh, part of this project or, or other projects. Uh, I, I have a question also. I think Greg started touching upon funding and Diana talking about Ceres de Bogota that was also something funded by the government. And just taking into consideration all the fires, for example, that's happening in Brazil and the fires that are happening in California. Uh, and a lot of these fires, they are, the government doesn't seem to care that much <laughs> in Brazil, for example. So I just wonder how is the relationship with uh, working with the government or when you're doing work for public spaces versus private clients? And it has been very difficult because we are uh, the citizens, volunteers, and we are very apart from the government. And we are trying to um, give the relevance of, of, the, of the biodiversity of the city in the plants. And um, still now, this uh, mayor, the, which is a woman mayor, she's more receptive about uh, this kind of process. But still, still it's difficult because, of course, now there we have a, another priorities of uh, health. But we are we have made this big campaign, and we have been uh, they are they are looking at us, and and they are talking with us. So, and we also um, began a campaign with the children that children can talk about how they imagine they the diversity in the cities and the streets. And uh, they are taking those, those voices in the plan. And I'm working, because I'm not working, I'm, I'm doing volunteer, but we are, they are taking these, um, these voices and, and our messages to the future plan of Bogota. So I'm very optimistic now, hopefully, after 11 years of this um, work, but uh, I think maybe this time is going to be the time. Sorry, Ines uh, had to go deal with her newborn for one second. Um, so uh, I think, you know, uh, Fundamental is a, it's pretty new program and um, 
we know we can't really say that we planned it out very um cohesively from start to finish but it essentially runs without money um all the projects you saw were built for less than ten thousand dollars um and that's for three months of includes um housing for the students <coughs> who come for three months and uh, i think that the government organizations that we have worked with in the past um they are not really willing to again there's bureaucracies that are impediments to progress but governments have tons of resources when it comes to materials because they build roads and they build bridges and these things and if you can sort of leverage existing um, resources that people kind of have at their fingertips and are used to working with at a um, exponential level of scale for them it's nothing to donate a few truckloads of gravel right but for us it helped create mounds um, with in combination with donated materials and co combination with donated expertise and these kind of things um, so our our program is 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 very interesting to us not only because of the way that we bring people together but the way that we get everyone to actually have um essentially be a literal stakeholder in contributing um something of actual value um you know, put it into this like potluck dinner let's say um and so that's been very exciting to us to see how getting also to learn the way philanthropy works in the states or grants work in the states doesn't necessarily translate down to Latin America, but other there are other ways of um, contributing with goods and services that are actually very fluid. I just want to make a comment to um, Louise's um, question, and I think all of these comments also. Um, I, I have a theory, um, having worked with a lot of communities in Brazil, that um, the this um, that you have called the spontaneous, um, Luis, um, it's almost it's always there. I think what we need to do is to acknowledge, um, you know, its its history and its existence also. Um, you know, and tell the story. Um, and I think the, the threshold between what is private and public, you know, there, there has been historically so much action. It's just not a story that is told. And um, there's so many, there's so many um, communities living in, you know, outside the, the kind of um, homogeneous um, standards that, that, that we have precluded as, as the ones that, you know, we have to live in. Um, and sometimes I, I, I just think it's, it's a question of unco un uncovering it, like it, that word doesn't exist in English, but letting it be seen. Um, even, and I think um, urbanization has a lot to do with that. Um, like when you, it's very different when you work with a community that is in a very urban area and is considered poor and devoid of any kind of um, identity or another one who is as poor as this other one, um, but somehow is grounded in another kind of set of values and can fun function in a much um, grounded way. Um, um, but but even in, in, in even in the communities in Sao Paulo, you know, Sao Paulo is this humongous, cruel <laughs> metropolis. And when you go to the periphery, it's, you know, the, the amount of misery and, 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 and poverty is overwhelming. And still, um, you know, someone is doing their little chicken, you know, cage where you know like they learned in Ceará up north and you know and there's a story to be told about that or a garden that has been you know the place where the women um you know um congregate so I, I don't know I think without wanting to be romantic but I think you know there's also stories that we need to learn how to hear I think to listen to I, I think what I was after in my question had to do with the fact that, for example, and this is something that um, 
Jessica brought up in her presentation is like, okay, they're making these things that seem to kind of solve a problem that is very, very real needed problem. And it's done in a way that is both kind of communal, um, community, participate, per, per community participatory, and, and seemingly, I don't know, I, I would assume that it's inexpensive and that this seems, seems to be like a solution that could be applicable in a lot of kinds of instances, but that to, to a certain extent Infonavit, the kind of great housing Mexican kind of conglomerate of sorts cannot accept, even they might know that there is this incredible need to solve this problem. And so like, how do we begin to, not in a kind of romantic way, but how do we begin to literally kind of make proposals that are just very much, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say like, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, like knowledge that has come over like, you know, hundreds of years, that is very practical knowledge that may not necessarily be part of the like center, it's eccentric in fact, um, that could actually be kind of a solution to like all of the, all of the pro like some, like a lot of problems. And I think all of the practices from today talk about these different ways of approaching, you know, certain issues that may not be kind of standard or traditional or, you know, and so how do we make these things? And I, so whoever brought, I think it was Gregory that brought up the thing about the slow, slow food movement. How do we bring this to um, architecture? And it seems like the, the practices that we saw today are a great example of a kind of laboratory where these things are being kind of tested. Um, and, and so if the tests are successful, how, how do we, how, you know, how do we disseminate this knowledge so that, you know, Maybe, you know, the, the buildings that Comunal is building, you know, in Oaxaca can actually be built in the peripheries of Sao Paulo, for example, or like a, something that would be parallel, you know, to kind of allow for these things. So this is the basis yeah, of my question. The, the, the interesting thing is that as um, their experience and, and experiments have happened, a lot have already happened also in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and they didn't continue. So I think it has to do also with this breaking you know the threshold of, of of being an agent and being recognized as such and we don't do that historically right with same thing with minorities and you know whatever it is but i think to i think the other thing that i and i think I, that's what i was trying to say um when i was talking to jessica is that we need to um change the metrics so what is it that we are quantifying right so, and that's why I, I got to be a little bit help, uh, hopeful when um, we started a discussion with banks in Brazil and the situation now with, um, like Alice is saying, is so crazy in Brazil, right? I mean, all over the world, that um, the private sector is the one who has, is stepping in to have a discourse to save <laughs> our natural resources. That crazy, you know, it is. So, <laughs> How do we influence um, the, 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 how, how value and how, um, and how um, success is, is measured? That's, I think, the, 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 the key. So if it has to do with what Jessica is saying, if it has to do with the metrics of well-being, right? How, how do you measure that? And it's and it, every not-for-profit, I would say in Brazil, maybe even the world, that I've participated in, that I'm at the board with, in, in has that problem because at the end of the day, you need a report and you need to justify the money that the UN gave you or this company or the government gave you. And what is the metric? Or you say, oh, you know, the kids are happier. So how do you measure that? Um, so that's why I'm saying that in terms of the material, I think there's a path now that we're trying to understand, but I think we need as architects to be very radical and it's and we well, I don't think we have started that yet, which is to trace the story and the carbon footprint of materials. Because that is a metric that we're trying that we're starting to understand and then natural materials are going to make a, a more sense and then temporality is going to make more sense. You don't need to build a building that lasts a hundred years. You don't need to build that. You, so, need to, you need to help the community, you know, to, 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 you are saying, I, I'm sorry, I interrupt you, but uh, about the metrics, no, we are not uh, having metrics for social impacts and cultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, agreements. 
I think we have to learn how to make the conversations because we always try to bring us, bring up our perspective from our ways of resolving things. And in the, in the case that we, you were talking about indigenous people, we have to bring the conversation and hear and not to push the ideas from, from where is our perspective. We have to bring that conversation and learn to have the conversation in a different way. And also like the, that, that metric uh, needs to be built by the people who is living those places, who is uh, building their own constructions. No? And not in a romantic view, because also what we always say is that participation is not a romantic view. Any of, uh, any of you that if you uh, approach to participation in a community, in a project, you can see that participation is a process of negotiation. It, it is never a romantic process. No, It's always a big struggle between different interests, interests between different logics, and between different perspectives of, your, of reality. But if uh, we can open the di uh, a dialogue between uh, persons, it will be much better. We will have much better uh, metrics if they build those metrics not, and, and that they are not built by the government or by the enterprises or by the real estate. So I think that uh, we have been this, this um, idea of colonization of, the way, of what should be like the the good living or the best living or the or 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 or, or like um, a life that can be suitable for each each one uh, has to be built from from the people who are um, part of those projects like not not even not us that you are uh, being with them it has to be from their own uh, cosmovision from their own way of living because. Uh, people from urban areas and from rural areas will have completely different metrics of the projects, completely different, no? It's not just about uh, uh, um, the sector or, of, of who are making them, but also the reality of uh, that each people is having in their life, all the experiences. And that is why participation and interculturality are very strong tools to, to make this happen. Uh, I think we are wrapping up the conversation. If anyone have any last questions or comments. And uh, I wanted to lastly to touch upon uh, Greg's comment. You touch upon monolith. I think that's uh, one thing I wanted to uh, bring to the conversation to lay the ground for our next conversation is the word Latin America. So as you were saying, Guatemala City is this melting pot, Sao Paulo, other like big urban cities are this really large melting pot, yet everything is uh, defined as Latin America. So what is Latin America? Would people there's so many people from Latin America in the United States. Are they Latinos? Are they from Latin America? So I think uh, if you could expand a little on that point. I'll try. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think being, I'll just speak uh, from my own experience. Um, being from the United States, uh, we're pretty bad with geography. We're pretty ignorant people in general. And uh, one of the reasons our firm is called Tayer Ken is because when I first came to Guatemala, uh, it was my first time in Latin America, and I kept uh, asking Ines, what is taller? I keep seeing this word everywhere, taller, taller this, taller that. And she's like, no, tanto es Tayer. And so like, it takes from an outsider, there's a very high barrier to entry mentally for Latin America. Um, we just think of everything as South of America and, um, and clearly that's incredibly ignorant, but also being there, as I sort of talked a little bit through our slides, um, there's the, the, the different world of the Hispanic overlaid in the indigenous culture, the, in our case, um, the living Mayan culture. And after that, 
after you kind of break through that, you start to realize, oh, there's a, there's a, there was a wave of Germans that came over to do the coffee plantations. And part of Costa Rica and Guatemala look awful lot like Switzerland. And frankly, I'm only familiar with uh, certain pockets of Central America. So I'm the worst possible person to talk and I'll, I'll stop. But, um, but I think that there's the idea that there is a Latin America whatsoever is, is a completely false, um, construct there's a sort of um uh, like with anything there's layers of of uh, upon layers and blended cultures and i think for us that's uh, trying to express that in our design as much as possible and creating this kind of pastiche allows more people into the design work rather than kind of an a limited palette a streamlined minimalism or anything that just starts to set up walls between people Yeah, I think that's really well put and I start conversation for the next conversation series we're going to have. Uh, Anna is going to lead. So everyone in the call is very welcome. It will be December 1st. So I would like to thank all the panelists, everyone who came to support us, the professors who are here as well. Thank you. And then uh, if we might ask the panelists to stay a little bit on the call. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. <laughs>